Welcome to the Masters of Engineering podcast. It's cool products, the people who develop them and how they do it. I'm your host, John Hirschtick. I've spent my entire life building CAD systems, but the best part of my job is I get to meet some of the coolest people in the world of product development and manufacturing. And in this podcast, you get to meet them too. Now today, a very special guest, Jake Hall, the manufacturing millennial is here to join us. And he is a noted uh, influencer and content creator and passionate about a lot of things, but particularly bringing the next generation um, into the world of manufacturing. Jake, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, John. That was, uh, that was a great introduction. I appreciate being on. Well, um, I'm really excited to have you here because you're a little different than some of my guests. I talk to a lot of people who build products themselves. Mm -hmm. But for you, it sounds like, you know, what you do is you kind of are influencing others to build products. Is that right? Yeah. You know, I would say influencing others to build products, but also advocating how those products can change our industry and change the perspective on how our manufacturing industry is viewed. You talked about you're an influencer and content creator. Can you, you know, to you, that probably is very clear, but to some of our audience, they may not know exactly what that means. Can you tell yeah. us a little more about that? I would say my goal is to create more awareness on what's happening in the manufacturing, the automation, the robotics, and the, and the, and the technology industry um, that, that encompasses a lot of what we do. Um, you know, for, for so for so long, there's been influencers in different industries advocating shoes or sports or just other passions. You know, there there's there's follow, there, there's there's content creators that are 15 million followers on YouTube that advocate about Apple products, and and I said this wow. is kind of crazy how we don't have anyone advocating and trying to highlight what's happening in manufacturing and all the cool mm. stuff about that. And I'll kind of jump into how this whole idea started. John, yeah. Though. Yeah. So back when I came out of college, I worked for an automation distributor and we were part of an organization that had all the other distributors um, join every, you know, a couple of times a year to highlight what's happening in our industry. And I attended one of these events and sitting in a room of about 400 people, I was the only person, Jen, I would say under the age of 40 that was attending this manufacturing conference. And I said, this is ridiculous. How do we not have younger generations, younger people engaged in our industry? Um, and so the whole idea of the manufacturing millennial came about from that is saying, you know, I'm a young person in manufacturing. I think it's fantastic. I totally understand that manufacturing isn't just this dark, dirty, dangerous doll industry. It's an industry full of technology and innovation and change, but we need someone to advocate what that looks like. Um, so I, I, during the pandemic, I said, I'm going to start leveraging social media, which is where our millennials and Gen Zs live in terms mm -hmm. of engaging content and, and, and getting information. And I'm going to start highlighting all the cool stuff that we do in the industry. So over the past year and a half, I Highlight what technology is impacting manufacturing. Where's robotics moving in the industry? Where's artificial intelligence changing vision and software and robotics? And, and really from a, a new perspective of for so long, for example, on LinkedIn, LinkedIn was just used as an additional sales tool, right? People just took their line card and posted it on LinkedIn and said, hey, here's a new product feature that we have, or here's a new line mm -hmm. that we picked up. They didn't talk about the industry. They just tried to sell to the industry. And I wanted to change things from what I learned from what other social what, what other social influencers are doing was I want to advocate how we're solving problems in the industry and not talk so much about the product, but the problem. Mm -hmm. And and so over the last year and a half or so, I've I've grown to about 45,000 followers on, on LinkedIn. Congratulations. Um, I've got about 50 million views on my content. And, and, and for us, I think what's important is, is how do we advocate to end users and the customers how technology is, is changing our industry, not only to make us more productive in what we're doing in our day-to-day -day lives, but also how do we use that then technology to leverage to say, come to our industry, to these younger generations, um, mm -hmm. and, and make them a part of what we're doing. You know, John, I heard you speak at the the Boston Robotics Summit. right we were both so, at the the Robotics Summit yeah you asked me a question right yeah so we were we yeah. were there and then I think after you Greg Smith from he's the president of Teradyne was on and he threw a statistic out there saying 
of Gen Zs between the ages of four and the four four years old and twenty two, which is that Gen Z in generation. Uh-huh. Um, thirty six percent want to go into a STEM based industry. Thirty four percent want to go into medical. But then you go all the way down to the bottom of the list. Manufacturing was at like three point six percent. So only 3.6% of this new wow. upcoming generation wants to enter the manufacturing wow. industry. And I think a lot of that has to do is because we perceive manufacturing as where our grandparents used to work in a factory that was dark, dirty, dangerous. Mm-hmm. It was full of grease. Yep. It was loud. It was, you know, dull. There wasn't anything new that was happening. It was very manual. And that's just not yeah. the case in the general overview of what our industry is. And so, we need to advocate, and that's what I do on, I, I guess, as an industry okay. influencer, advocating to drive awareness on how our industry is changing. Well, you uh, so many things I want to ask you about there in just what you said. You said um, you said they, they, that a, a large percentage are interested in a STEM career. Correct. Now, wouldn't some of those, when they say STEM career, wouldn't they be thinking about things that we might, some of them, be thinking about things we might consider product design or manufacturing wouldn't that when is it a case of nomenclature a I, little bit i think i think so in a little bit but i want to say you know when you look at the general consensus of what manufacturing is viewed at we're not viewed as a high-tech industry you know mm. from it from an outside perspective yeah. looking in now you and i both know for being in the industry for a long Very time it's, it's the opposite yeah. Ops, <laughs> you know <Oppo. laughs> you know say. the largest manufacturers out there they already get it in terms yeah. of what technology and solutions are available. They have teams, they have a chief technology or a chief innovation officer from the highest level looking at that. But from the general perspective, what manufacturers are in the US. So like 96 yeah. to 98% of manufacturers in the US are under 500 employees. 76% of them are under 50 employees. CAD business, by the way, where I've spent my career, I always say there's so many small customers. People are mm-hmm. like, well, you know, those customers who use one or two seats of CAD, who cares? I'm like, that's most of the market. Are the, yeah, are the smaller designers is. and manufacturers? You said, and this I wanted to make sure this came out in the audience. Maybe you can comment on. Did you say, um, I think it was 26% of manufacturing workers today are above age 50, 26% yeah. compared to 14% 20 years ago. Is that right? So it's gone from 14 to 26% are let's say, um, seasoned people, yeah. of which yeah. I am a member of that. Uh, I am, I'm, let's say, I, I would even go beyond over 50. I would qualify for the next level o- over 60. And that's a dramatic swing, right? Yeah. That's a it's crazy a swing. swing. First of all, who's a millennial? Who do you consider millennial? Yeah, I mean, so it, it's it's classified into age groups, right? Gen Z, which is our youngest generation, yep. is between the ages of four and 20. Uh, millennials are right around 20 to 22 to all the way up to 40. And then you have, you know, the Gen, the Gen X, the silent majority, and then you have the boomers, and then you have the greatest generation, you know. So, okay. so that's kind of the scale. But I would say the majority of millennials is forty and under, you know, including the the Gen Z. So it includes group. the Gen Z. When you say millennial, yeah, yeah. When I say millennial, I'm talking about the younger, the younger workforce generation, okay. the the generation that grew up with technology. You know, okay. that, that wasn't adapted. I think that's why a lot of these younger generations are classified because we grew up with the cell phone. We weren't an adult when the cell phone and when the technology was, you know, yeah. a couple years. So, so, you know, oh, we're talking about my birthday is today. I'm turning 33. Yeah. Well, in 1989, the World Wide Web was invented. You know, yeah. so I was born the same year the internet started. Yeah. And, and so we grew up with that. I mean, to put it in yeah. perspective, I have, I have a four-year-old daughter. She has her own iPad. She plays with it. She has a lot of learning games. And I think, yeah. I think you know, digital education is is a massive impact on our future. And we won't get into yeah. that. But um, no, you know, it's it. Well, it's part of it because when you say technology, you're talking about digital technology. Because yeah. when I was a kid, we had technology. We had television. Mm-hmm. You know, which my my father didn't grow up with television, but I did, and we were the first year. So we had radio, television, the automobile. You know, we had telephones. Those were considered tech. But you're talking, when you say technology, if I may, digital technology, yeah. essentially, part is that part of what you call digital transformation, which is another one of your terms, right? Your areas yeah. of expertise. Is that about getting people, you know, would, would it be the digital transformation of people 
begins with that millennial generation? Is that I, I would say I would say so. Yeah. And I, I think when you look at the digital transformation, I think it's that idea of what's that cultural change that manufacturers are doing to adapt and integrate industry 4.0 technology. And I think we've okay. all seen that idea of industry 4.0. It's collaborative robots. It's additive manufacturing. It's IT, OT, it's cybersecurity, it's cloud-based services, it's, you know, software as a service. And you have this encompass of what we view as new industry 4.0 versus the industrial 3.0 resolution, yeah. uh, revolution. But I think what, what I look at, you know, for me is going, going to, to my daughter is she's, she's four years old and she understands technology and, I, and the iPad better than my father, who's 64 years old. Uh -huh. and, and, and I think your father's 64. Yeah. Wow. Now you're making me feel old, Jake. <laughs> but, you know, I think it's one of those things, though, John, is when when you look at why does my generation, why does the Gen Z generation not want to be in manufacturing is because why would they live in a technology immersed world and culture, but then go work for a manufacturer that's living 20 years ago in the past? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, well, that's because they perceive. Do you think that that's a perception thing? Do you think if they understood the true nature, and that's part of what you're, is that, dare I say, part of what you're trying to do? Yeah. Is get them to understand the tech and the coolness of it. That, and, and it's it's an even split right now because you walk into manufacturers and some of them get it. They get the technology, they get how, how device wearables and, and solutions to, to be, to drive more purpose and opportunity within a worker is important. But then you walk into some manufacturers who are still living 20 years ago in the past, who don't, who are still afraid mm -hmm. to throw in their first robot yeah. cell, who are still afraid to use digital work instructions to track productivity and data right. of their machines. Right. See it. Um, and you still walk yeah. in and there's a clipboard with a white piece of paper on it that was printed off in Excel. And they say, okay, how many parts did you produce per hour? Write that down. How many times did the machine stop per hour? Write that down. Yep. What was the air in the machine? Yep. Write that down. And, and they, it, yeah. And they use the coolest tools, which I think are things like CAD and CAM. Those they view like the drafting board. It's in the corner for the specialist user to mm -hmm. use. Oh, yeah. We use, we, you know, one of my, now I, I really hear an interview, but one of my observations checking with you is I view like they use digital essentially to, to automate, to essentially have the same workflow they had with paper. Mm -hmm. They're really doing the paper-based workflow. They're just doing some of it digitally. Yeah. You know, whereas the modern generation, they they expect, they naturally expect collaboration. Like your daughter with the iPad, she's mm -hmm. not going to be amazed at global collaboration. She's going to go grow up doing that in video games, right? Yeah. And and it's school. But but you know, manufacturing workers like, well, that's scary if you know everyone's accessing the data. Oh no, you know. And right, we see that. We see people who are like, you know, you mentioned uh do you say robots or cobots a moment ago? I know one of your slogans I want to ask you about is you say robots create better jobs. Is that your that's your quote, right? Uh, you know, I, I said it. I don't know if I was the first. Everyone has a everyone has a quote. You know, okay. you know. I think I mean. like like if you're an office fan, you know, there's a quote that Wayne Gretzky says, and then Michael Scott quotes Wayne Gretzky. You know, but I think everyone has a thing. But oh. yeah, I, I think I think robots create better jobs, and they create better opportunity. They create higher skilled jobs. They create higher paid jobs. Um, and and, and it's one of those things where. For the longest time, there is this idea that robots are taking people's yeah, jobs. And, yeah. and I think what robots truly do in, in the current state of the industry, right now there's 900,000 open jobs here in the United States that are unfulfilled. 900,000. Wow. Last year between um, – and this is another statistic that, that I saw – Something around the 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 value of like sixty to eighty billion dollars of revenue was lost since twenty twenty as a result of the labor shortage in manufacturing. Wow! So I had not I've not heard that statistic. Can you just say again? You say fifty billion? Yeah, some 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 billion. massive some massive wow. number. So that's our, that's, by the way, that's my audience here are those people who, who some of the people who will hear this podcast are people who lost that revenue. Cause you're yeah. saying they're the product developers and manufacturers out there in the United States alone, mm -hmm. you're talking about. And over what period you said 50 billion over. I think it's starting from like 2020 to now. So just in the last couple of yeah. years. 
yeah, fifty and, billion. And I'll, I'll try and I'll try and pull that right. up when um when we're talking, John. Just so I can grab me in for wrong. We'll no, 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 that's and, that's and the podcast. That's but, a lot of you know, but but okay, yeah, well, you could look it up, and so that's a lot. So you're saying this is a pro, this is a business problem, not just a social problem absolutely. or a national problem. And, and so what? So what robots are doing is they are enabling manufacturers to be more competitive on a global economy and mm-hmm. a, a global manufacturing industry that allows them to be more productive. And and yeah. if we can have a robot do a task that's boring and repetitive and has a high turnover rate, mm-hmm. make it so we can enable a worker to be more productive. So a worker can manage a cell of robots rather than the world, the worker doing the individual task itself. We're being more, we're more productive. Oh, okay. So, so you've got this, this robot create better job story. I can buy that sitting in my, you know, CAD software career in Boston and, you know, and all this, but you live in Michigan, right? Yes. So how do your, when you, where you sit in Michigan, how do your, you know, how do your friends and neighbors in Michigan feel about your, Robots create better jobs. So I, I got the number for you really quick, actually. So from um, spring of 2020 to current date, we have a 4% access in job openings in manufacturing as a result of the great resignation of manufacturing people even in the industry. We have lost $92 billion of manufacturing global wow. uh, of U.S. output in 2021. In one year? In one year, $92 billion. 92 so 90 billion in one year that is just amazing it's 90 i got i'm trying to do the math to figure out what it is on a daily basis yeah <laughs> i mean that's a when, lot and, and when you look at the industry right us manufacturing is a 2.3 trillion dollar industry so you know it was it was you know not a not even a percent at one percent of it but still 90 billion dollars was lost and productivity here in the u.s as a result of labor shortage oh, wow, wow. um so, so to go back what's the perception of where i'm at in west michigan um thankfully i am blessed to live in an area that has a lot of manufacturing and and a lot of automation companies here in west michigan we have a lot of tier one tier two tier three automotive companies that are supporting you know all the companies on the on the east side of the state but we also have a lot of medical a lot of food and bev um so for the general consensus here people get automation in a lot of aspects. And that's because we've grown up. There's a lot of universities. I would say a lot of the colleges and universities here have worked really well um, to drive, you know, opportunity. Um, But from when I go to like a family reunion, I talk to them about, I work in automation and manufacturing and they're like, Oh, so those robots are the ones taking people's jobs. Yeah. Immediately I'm I'm like, no, yeah. If you're right. the, the bad guy. And on yeah. top of that, robots aren't going to take over the world. They're not going to turn into Skynet. You know, yeah. you have you have another company over in, in Boston that's you know famous for having a you know a, I don't know if people can if people are watching, I'm holding a, a spot robot oh, yeah. model. Yeah, from Boston um, Dynamics. Yeah of, of when I was hanging out in Boston yeah. Dynamics. Um, but you know, spot robots aren't gonna take over the world, they're not gonna run and ruin people's lives, they're gonna enable better jobs. And, and after I have a conversation with them, they get it. At least they, you know, either they just agree with me. So I stop talking um, okay. or, <laughs> you know, okay. they actually so get you don't it. have a hard time, but you're not talking to people who are in the, the town where everyone lost their job because the plant that made mattresses closed and they were the only employer in town. Yeah. You're talking to the people who have really engaged and survived and thrived, which you see a lot in America. By the way, I see that, too, because I travel around and meet a lot of people. I see a lot of great stories, but what's your, I got, I mean, we only, we, we're, we're, we're getting short on time because I could talk to you all day. So I can give you a lot of questions quickly here. What's the overall state of, of manufacturing in America? Now we have a global audience, but I'm going to say in the U S and America, what's your view? You should be in a really good position to see the whole thing. Are you like America's coming back or America's got yeah. big problems or Amer- America's coming back and automation is a tool that's making that happen. Um, okay. Na- great, 19, great 1995, quote. the uh, wage difference between China manufacturing and us manufacturing was 30 times. So 30 times greater. 30 X. Right. Right. And current state 2020 is 3.5%, 3.5 3, 3, 3. times. So we're seeing oh, really? that the, the wow. gap between labor, and overseas wow. compared to us is massive. That's it. It's only three and a half times. Three and a half times now. See, I still was under this illusion that, like, you know, 
you know, uh, you know, China workers. I, I don't want to say what I thought, but you know, we're, yeah. we're, uh, it's amazing. So I, I guess I'm still thinking of the 30 X and you're saying now it's close to three X. Um, what advice do you have? What could our average manufacturer do to attract younger people or to help with your mission of bringing that next generation in? Great, great question, John. So I would say for the majority of manufacturers in America, their talent comes local. You're not able to draw people from across the sea to come and work for your manufacturing company, you know, and, and across the states. Um, great point. What manufacturers need to do is they need to do a better job engaging locally with their community colleges, their skilled trades programs, their universities, and their high schools. If you want, if you truly want to make an impact in manufacturing and get that next generation of workforce, you need to work locally. And like, that's the one reason why I love doing my content on social media is because I can create those conversations to encourage people all across the U S to be more engageable working with first robotics programs, which I know, yeah. you know with that, that on shape does and, and yeah. getting those kids excited yeah. about what the industry can offer and, and how we're doing things differently. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's one of those things is before, Back in, back in high school, we didn't have a CAD program because we couldn't afford licenses on all of our PCs, and let alone yep. half the PCs couldn't even drive the software to begin with. That's changing. And, you know, just selfish on shape plug, right? Because now there's this technology called the cloud, which enables yeah. us to do a lot more that way. Yeah. But it's not even just the cloud. It's now there's a technology called artificial intelligence, which enables vision and robotics to do tasks that were never achievable before because there was too much variability in those processes. And, and I think what we need to do from a general perspective of people living this conversation, we need to understand that technology has changed more in the last five years than mm -hmm. it has in the last 50. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and I think, you know, if, if you were to go, people, people who haven't gone to a trade show that this year, there's still plenty of time. We're halfway through the year. Go to a trade show and see how manufacturing and solutions have changed the industry. People still have this perception of what they think, com, you know, computer, you know, design is or what yeah. robots is. Or yeah. what no, is. you're absolutely right. You know, but that's yeah. not the case anymore. And that's, and that's that perception that we need to change. We need to educate ourselves to understand what technology is out there, but we also need to educate our local education great, system look, on what skills they point. need to be teaching. I'm just saying, get out to the local, you know, local, the local schools, the local educational institutions at all levels, get engaged with them. It's, it's really a great point. First robotics is one way to do it, yeah. but just walking in the door, they're hungry for it. By the way, sidebar, you know, just to support what you're saying, you know, in the on-shape education side of the on-shape world, where we have additions, for students and for whole schools now, that has exploded. Yeah. We have um, we have over a million and a half students and teachers. We um, we we it's like the market's flipped. Why young people today? They don't know C colon backslash and yeah, Windows and all. Absolutely. They don't know what files are. By the way, great article on the Verge if you haven't seen it called "File File Not Found" about kids in university engineering programs who don't know what files and folders are. Because like your daughter, they're all going iPad and Chromebook. I have kids too. I see it in my yeah. older kids. Um, uh, uh, last thing, I see the Cubs hat. You you grew up a Cubs fan. That's For those who don't know, that's a Chicago baseball team if you're out of the United States. But yeah. if you're in the United States, go Cubs. Um, uh, have you been a Cubs fan your whole life? I would say, yeah. I mean, okay. and, and I and I married I married uh, an amazing wife who was from Illinois. She moved. We met online. She moved from Illinois to Michigan, and she's a, a much more diehard Cubs fan than I am. So uh, I definitely married up in 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 Cubs. Oh passion. well, I grew up. I also grew up in Chicago as a Cubs fan on the north yeah. side. Um, you know, uh, Vienna hot dogs are still one of my favorite things. Absolutely. Uh, you know, a uh, super dog, all that. Um, uh, but I wanted to ask you, do you think being a Cubs fan who had to wait decades for a world series championship, <laughs> which they won a few years ago in case people don't know it, um, did that make you, did that help you be more patient in pursuing your career? Or is that just a crazy idea? I, I think, question? I think of what made me understand if we're actually looking for like a serious answer to that, yeah. it made you understand understand, enjoy the journey that's getting you to where you are and, and, and enjoy all the small things, not always necessarily the big goal, 
But some of my best memories of, of being at Cubs games was just spending time with family, drinking a beer, eating a Vienna hot dog and, you know, a Supreme nacho and just having conversations in that memory. Yeah. Granted, a lot of those games we didn't win. We yeah. won some games in 2016 yeah. when I attended, you know. But, like, for me, though, I think it's one of those things where enjoy why you're there and not yeah. what you're hoping to get out of it in a lot of areas. So You know, that's a great – you know, that's a great – bringing it back to how we open with you being an influencer and content creator. Jake, I want to thank you for being on the podcast today. I think we could have ca- talked, we could do 10 episodes with you. You got so much. We'll, we'll come say. back and do another but, one. John. But no, you know, but this was great. And to, to bring it right back, you are enjoying what you're doing and you, clearly you focused on what you felt was important. And, you know, it's no surprise you've been so successful with, with so many followers and views. Do we talk about that? 40,000 followers, 50 million views of your yeah. content. Is that right? I want yep. to make sure everyone heard that. 50 million. Incredible impact. You may be single-handedly be telling more people more things about manufacturing, getting into it, than a lot of other initiatives combined. So think about that for a minute. I just want to thank you for joining us. To our listeners, thank you all for tuning in. You can learn more about Jake and um, uh, see some of his content. I know you're on LinkedIn. That's how I find yep. you, at the Manufacturing Millennial it's Jake Hall. If you just punch Jake Hall on the LinkedIn, you'll see the guy with the Cubs hat and manufacturing mail. Anyhow, um, what about uh, other other places you'd point our audience who wants to learn? Yeah, I, I mean, so content? if you were just to type in Jake Hall or manufacturing millennial with Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, you'll be able to find my pages. But I'm on I'm on all social media okay. platforms, all social media platforms. And then in terms of this podcast, remember, you can listen to this episode or other episodes at Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, wherever you like to find your podcast. We also now are putting out our Masters of Engineering podcast on video. So this is some of you are listening just to audio, some are watching the video. Remember, I love hearing what you think. So make sure you leave a review of this episode and tell me what you thought of Jake and his story. You can follow me on Twitter at J Hirschtick, J-H-I-R-S-C-H-T-I-C-K. That's it for today. See you next time on Masters of Engineering.